Okay, so why has this all been so incredibly difficult? Why has there been no effective legislation in the United States, and why especially are the attacks on science so effective? So in the book we talk about a few different things, and I'm gonna talk about them here, not in any particular order, and not really in the order in the book, but in the way I've been thinking about it in the last few weeks. So the first obvious answer is money, and I don't have to tell people in this room, but it's important to really keep money central, but in the right kind of way. So to paraphrase James Carville, it's the money, stupid. But it's not money in the sense of science to selling out. In the story we tell, the scientists we track don't do what they do for money. In a minute, I'll talk about what they do. But what they do is powerful and effective and spreads in part because of money, because of the, the way in which corporate interests, and not just the fossil fuel industry, all kinds of industries um, channel money into think tanks like the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the Heartland Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, the, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on and on, all of whom promote free market solutions to social and economic problems in order to prevent the government from acting, in order to prevent the government from regulating dangerous practices and products. And the corporations that support this are very widespread. It's not just the fossil fuel industry. Um, it includes many, many other organizations. And we see, we show in our book, we talk about how Philip Morris in the 1950s continued to support all kinds of think tanks that had nothing to do with tobacco because they supported free market solutions. And that brings us to the second most important part of the story, which is ideology. That what's driving much of this, what's justifying the money that's being pumped into this is the ideology of the free market the ideology of free enterprise, of laissez-faire economics, or what some people call neoliberalism. And many ordinary citizens accept this ideology as sensible and logical because they believe that in a democracy, the best government is the government that governs least. And it's the power of that belief, which in principle is not nuts, right? And it's not necessarily related to thinking that the whole world is a masterpiece. Well, there's an empirically false statement if I ever saw one. <laughs> um, you know, so you don't have to be a crazy fundamentalist Christian to believe in America that the government that governs best is the government that governs least. And it's deeply, deeply, deeply founded, right, in our political ideology going back to the founding fathers. And that's what we're up against in this story. And I think that's incredibly important to understand in order to really appreciate how and why this has been so powerful. Okay, but it's not just money and ideology. There's two other important pieces of the story too. And we've been criticized in reviews by people even who love us saying that we weren't hard enough on the scientists. And that's probably true. When we were reading the book, we kind of had this feeling like we didn't want to blame the victims, and we didn't really want to go into a big harangue about what scientists had done wrong. But there's no question that scientists have contributed to the problem in lots of different ways. As many of you know, if you've hung out with scientists, lots of them can't really be let out in public. Um, most of them don't know how to speak to ordinary people. Many of them are arrogant. And they all, in my experience, don't want to simplify the problem, right? They want to do justice to the complexity of the scientific issues. And they dedicate their lives to doing complexity. And if you interview them or you write about this as bloggers, you've, I'm sure, come across this, right? And it's a real challenge if you're in the media or writing about it to say, well, yes, I know that. I know it's complicated. I know it's subtle. And I know you've worked incredibly hard to put that third decimal place on the ice melting in Antarctica, but for the public, right? The public needs to understand this in a much simpler way. And the challenge of communicating it um, in a way that most people can grasp is not a trivial one. And I think that's where bloggers can really play a hugely positive role. That's this is my positive message, right? That all of you have the capability of explaining this stuff to other people in terms that they can understand. Um, and uh, Eric and I and a whole lot of other people are really sad this morning too because of the death, uh, so yesterday or the day before yesterday? Monday. Monday of Steve Schneider, who was one of the few climate scientists who knew how to get up in front of a room and talk about it in a way that was powerful and convincing and people could understand. Um, so now that Steve is gone, more people are going to need to step up into that, um, into that void. And then finally, the fourth thing, again, which is highly relevant for this room, is the role of the media. And all I can say is that it's been appalling. <laughs> you know, Eric and I spent a lot of time looking at how the media presented these issues and time and time and time again the media presented these issues as big scientific debates when in fact the science was settled, when in many cases the science had been settled for a long time and there was a debate 
there was a political debate, just as there is over evolution. There is a political debate over evolution in America, but there's not a scientific debate about whether creatures have, you know, whether there's been change over time, right, in the constitution of organisms on Earth. So the conflation of the political and scientific debate is very damaging, and of course it's part of the deliberate strategy of those who want to avoid action, because as long as they can keep us fighting about the science, as long as they can keep us arguing about the science, it prevents us from moving on to the policy action. And that's the whole point of it. And the media have been completely sucked in to that debate framework for all kinds of reasons, which I'm sure most of you already understand. So I think it's incredibly important for all of us to make clear there has been a scientific consensus on global warming for a long time. Scientists were first predicting this back in the 50s and 60s. We know the President's Science Advisory Committee was warning about the threat of global warming in 1965. We know that Lyndon Johnson was talking about global warming and climate change in the 1960s. We know that by the 1970s there was a consensus among scientists that global warming would occur. It was expressed by the National Academy of Sciences, not just by Greenpeace. And we know that by the early 1990s, there was a consensus that global warming was, in fact, occurring. And that's why we had the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, which was signed by President George H.W. Bush. But also, Americans suffer massive historical amnesia. It's like none of that happened. It's all been forgotten. So we need to remind people, we need to tell people global warming is a fact, not a theory. We've known a lot about it for a long time. Scientists have been trying to warn us, but they haven't done a really good job. And it's up to us now to say we get it, we understand it, and we need to communicate it to the rest of America.